Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari ST A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari ST games, some which I grew up with and some which are new to me. Today is one of the latter. Today we're taking a look at The Untouchables, which was a 1989 release by Ocean Software based on the 1987 movie starring Kevin Costner and Sean Connery. This was one of Ocean's many, 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 many licensed games from the 16-bit period in particular. Uh, and in fact, this game was one of the ones that caused Ocean to uh, shift their focus more to the 16-bit home computers as opposed to the 8-bit computers that they'd had uh, a decent amount of success with prior to this. Uh, this was actually one of Ocean's more well-regarded games. They had a fairly mixed reception. Uh, on the whole, with uh, some of them fe being fairly unimaginative platform games. Uh, and indeed, this is a platform game as well, but it's very technically competent, it's got good graphics, it's got some varied levels. Um, and so, yeah, this was this was reviewed pretty well. Now, in those reviews, um, it was pretty noteworthy to see a good review from the notoriously stingy ST format, for one thing. Uh, and also, The One magazine pointed out that the in-game characters don't bear much resemblance to actors like Kevin Costner and Sean Connery and so on. Uh, but they surmised that this was due to contractual obligations. So they were allowed to make a game about the movie, but they weren't allowed to use the likenesses of Costner and Connery in there, which makes a certain amount of sense. Although, on the other hand, it also doesn't make a lot of sense either. But whatever. They also highlighted the fact that the game makes use of... Um, sort of 1920s classic pieces of music like your Charleston and uh, Chattanooga Choo Choo and so on. And um, quite correctly said that while these are very much appropriate for the setting, it doesn't really fit with the tone of the game. But well, what are you going to do? Let's go play The Untouchables. OK, here we are with The Untouchables. Um, I must confess, I've never seen the movie of this. Um, I don't know much about it, aside from the fact that it's uh, based on the whole Elliot Ness versus Al Capone thing. But I do remember this game coming out. And I do remember it being pretty well received as well. But I've never actually played it before, so this is, this is all new to me today. So we begin with this first stage. Um, set in this warehouse. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee that I'll get past this stage today, unfortunately, because I, I did have a quick go at this earlier, and I was very bad at it. <laughs> so I'm making no promises, but you will get an idea for how this game works, what it looks like, and all, all that sort of stuff along the way. So your aim in this first stage is uh, to collect a bunch of evidence. Um... And that evidence can be found in these sort of tan coated characters here uh, who require a few more shots to dispatch than the grey grunts. And so what you need to do is proceed around the level, kill as many of the bad guys as you can for points uh, while making sure you don't run out of time, and follow that arrow in the upper right, upper left corner of the screen um, to track down where the the tan coated guy is and you then need to shoot the tan coated guy a bunch of times until he drops a ledger and you then collect that ledger that gives you 10% of the evidence you require to move on and then you repeat the process until Either you die or you get all the evidence. And as you'll move around, you'll see that there's, uh, there's uh, violin cases containing various lettered power ups that the grey guys will drop. So some of them will drop power ups for your weapon, uh, some of them will drop E's, which uh, restore your energy. which is reflected by the, the the red and green bars behind Ness's portrait. Uh, and some of them will provide auto fire, which lets you hold down the, um, the fire button to shoot more rapidly. Oh, and yes, you only have one life. So enjoy that. This is why I say I'm not making any promises as to 
whether or not I'm going to be able to make it through this first stage because it is tough and this is one thing that was highlighted in uh, reviews of the era it was noted that this is a difficult game this is a challenging game but deliberately so because there's only I think six stages in total Uh, so they had to put a certain degree of difficulty in there in order to um, keep people coming back for playing playing some more. Otherwise everyone would be, oh this is too short, I can't believe I spent £25 on this. Just like people do today. But yeah, this is a tricky game, mostly because... Um, the tan-coated guys actually have surprisingly good AI for the period. You'll notice as you watch me move around, he's sort of fairly actively dodging me and dropping down to lower levels to avoid me, to make it difficult for me to hit him. And get the stuff I require. Right, we've got 20% now. So that's good. One thing I will note about this is that this this is moving extraordinarily smoothly for an Atari ST game. Um, as many of you may know, the Atari ST wasn't brilliant at scrolling because it didn't have the same sort of hardware that even the Atari 8-bit had in, in some regards. And it certainly was not a patch on the Amiga when it came to scrolling screens. So seeing how smoothly this is moving around is uh, quite astonishing, really. I'm not at all accustomed to Atari ST games scrolling this smoothly. If you see any sort of weird um, artifacting, then that is a product of the fact that this is a PAL game running at 50 hertz, um, but I'm capturing on a 60 hertz display. So uh, that means that there is some occasional sort of wibbly wobbliness in the background that you might notice. Um, but if you're playing this on a proper 50 hertz monitor or TV then none of that would be noticeable and this would be absolutely silky smooth I'm also capturing at 30 frames per second as well so you know there's that too uh, so you might not even see what I'm referring to but so success in this first stage appears to be about balancing your time chasing the tan coated guy um, with shooting the grey coated guys in order to get power ups and it's especially important to get the energy power ups because um, there's not really an easy way of dodging there's not an easy way of dodging enemy bullets um, and so you need those energy restorations because you're going to take damage regardless you're always going to take damage in this game and so you need to keep yourself topped up on those energy power-ups because otherwise you're just going to die because you only have one life so the controls are a little bit clunky you move left and right, you can crouch by pushing uh, in a direction and down at the same time. And you jump by pushing up in a direction. And you can also climb up platforms by pushing up when you're standing still. Now that's probably the clunkiest bit because it's not always entirely obvious what you can climb up and what you can't because it's not always entirely consistent in terms of how the background represents those parts of the scenery. So it can be a little bit fiddly to determine exactly what parts of the stage you can stand on and what, what parts you can't.
like there you see that there's there's no real sort of easy way of distinguishing those different boxes there you, there's no sort of sense of depth or anything but some of them you can stand on and some of them you can't it doesn't really make a lot of sense can do with some energy I'm also running low on time that time limit I had at the start doesn't it doesn't look like a, a particularly tight time limit but I mean we're down to just over a minute left and we've only got 30% of the evidence we've only got three out of the ten things that we need there he is So it's it's quite difficult to kill one of the tan coated guys because they move around so much and you have to hit them more than once. And so it becomes very difficult to actually achieve your objective. <laughs> Oh, and I'm dead. Good. Good. All right, let's have another go at that. I got the top score this time. That's that's the furthest I've got in this game so far. So let's see if we can get any further. Like I say, I'm making no guarantees that we'll even get off this first stage today. Um, and that's a bit of a shame because the, the later stages of this game, from what I understand, there's some interesting sort of third-person shooter segments um, that sort of unfold from... Um, over Ness's shoulder and they play like um, like a cabal shooter so it would be nice if we could get on to one of those stages to see how those are presented but like I said there's no way we're <laughs> no way we're getting through the whole thing today energy please energy please Yeah, like I say, I think I think the most the most troublesome thing about this game is just not knowing which things you can climb up and which things you can't. It's very unclear. I mean, like if you, if you look at how the backgrounds are presented, there's there obviously there's obviously supposed to be some sort of depth going on there. Like so, some of the some of the crates are in the background, and those are the ones you can't climb up. Um, but because there's not really a distinction made there in terms of colour it kind of makes it very difficult to, to judge and then as I say the your target moves around so much that it's very difficult to actually get what you're supposed to be getting from them just because you need to hit them several times and they're actively avoiding you as well which in some respects is cool because this is this is some of some of the better ai that i've seen in a game of this period particularly this type of game um but at the same time it's frustrating because this is the first level and you'd sort of expect at the very least even in a hard game to be able to beat the first level but sadly this this wasn't at all uncommon with ocean games you may recall quite a while back we had a look at the um batman game that ocean did based on the batman movie and that was the same that had a monstrously difficult first level and then a lot of the cool stuff in the game like driving the batmobile flying the batwing that sort of thing that was all confined to the later stages of the game so on the one hand it was a reward for doing well but on the other a lot of players would have probably never seen that without cheat codes
But anyway, as, as I've said, it's, it's pretty clear why this was well received at the time, because it, it looks good. It moves incredibly smoothly, particularly for an Atari SD game. And it provides something just a little bit different from the usual run and gun formula. So you're actually you're actually trying to achieve a particular objective rather than just make it through a level. I mean, okay, that objective is incredibly frustrating and annoying. Yes. But still. Just die! Right. Two and a half minutes left to get eight more pieces of evidence. <laughs> I don't see it happening. Also, I'm about to die as well. Yep, there we go. Hmm. You have failed. You know, I'm just going to take a moment to see if there are any cheat codes for this that we can type in and maybe try some of the later levels. So I'll be right back. Okay, here we are. So apparently, if we pause the game. How do we do that? How, how do we do that, in fact? I don't know how we pause the game. If I can figure out how to pause the game, we can try this. But it's... None of the keys I'm pressing on the keyboard are pausing the game. Oh, F10, obviously. Obviously, the key we always use to pause the game. Now, apparently, if you type in bridge rolls, there we go, um, it will skip you to the second stage. And disc one is into the drive. And so, this should take us to the second level. There's no way of skipping the second level, though, apparently. So, um, this may be as far as we go. But we'll see. Okay, so here we are. This is one of those third-person shooter levels. And you can see why the cheat code said bridge rolls, because... Well... So your job in this stage is to collect a bunch of liquor by shooting it. Oh, there's some. Uh, all the while fending off the unwanted attentions of Al Capone's cronies. First aid kit, yes please. Oh, that's interesting. Over in the bottom right corner it shows you where you're aiming. That's kind of neat. You know, after a certain point, you'd think just like getting up and walking would make more sense but no oh, I'm dead I have failed can we continue from there that's the question 
Yes, we can. Okay, that's good. So it seems almost like this game loads each level almost as a separate game. Because you'll notice we got a lengthy loading break when we skipped the first level. Uh, and then we got title screen again. Hmm. Hmm. Bring it on again. I'm not 100% sure how you reveal the bottles of liquor. Or if you're just supposed to spot them in the background. Oh, there's one. There's another one. Yeah, it looks like they might just appear in different places. And it's randomised. Do we one of those first aid kits right about now? If it's all right with you. No, I'm dead. That was going so well up until that point as well. Oh, she threw blind luck. But, well. This is really hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I get what they were going for with the movement and aiming system, but there's, there's just no way of avoiding attacks. And that's kind of the same problem that the first level has. Although, although in the first level the, the energy pickups seem to be much more widespread. And that's it's a bit easier to survive a bit longer, but in this one you take just you just take so much damage while you're searching the level. I mean, look, I'm over half health and I've shot two bottles so far. And the only way to get health back is to shoot one of those first aid kits and those only show up randomly. But there's no means of dodging, so I don't know how you're supposed to do that. So the distinct impression I'm getting with this game is it's it's good for an ocean game, and I think that was enough to get it some some praise when it first came out. Because Ocean did some decent stuff, but they also did a lot of absolute dreck back in the day as well. And so for them to put out something that was more competent than most of their other stuff was probably noteworthy at the time, but. From a modern perspective, this does not hold up very well. This is one thing I found quite interesting while um, while putting together the various different Atari A to Z series. One thing that I found fairly consistently. is that a lot of the earlier stuff 
a lot of the Atari 8-bit and Atari 2600 stuff, a lot of that holds up a lot better than some of the 16-bit stuff. There are exceptions, of course. There's a lot of 16-bit games that were genuinely incredibly innovative and still play very well today. I'm thinking specifically of stuff like um, Carrier Command and Star Glider and all that sort of thing. That stuff is all still absolutely great. But stuff like this... Stuff like this really doesn't hold up very well. And I think it's because in these arcade style games, it's so obvious how much we've learned about game design and mechanics in the intervening years that it's it's just painful to play something that isn't designed very well. Or whose mechanics haven't been sort of really thought through in detail. Excuse me. And that's really the problem here. Like what, what we've got here is we've got a good idea for a game, but we've got some fundamental aspects missing that would make it work. So like if you get if you're going to have a cabal shooter, you need some means of hiding or dodging. But what you have here, you just wherever you are on the screen, because there's no visible bullets to dodge, you, you just continually take damage. And there's nothing you can do about it. Like, all they needed to do to make this work would be restore a bit of health when you get a liquor bottle. Or restore a pip of health when you shoot someone. That way they wouldn't have needed to even add a cover system or anything like that. Because that way the gameplay would be sustainable. rather than based on random chance like it is now. Because at the minute you're completely at the mercy of the game and whether it decides that you're getting hit or not. coupled with where it decides to put the liquor bottles and whether or not it decides to spawn a first aid kit for you. And if it doesn't spawn a first aid kit then you're fucked really because there's just that constant incoming damage and nothing you can do about it. And you can't even like clear a path for yourself with the with the enemies because they just keep coming. They just keep coming. There's no way of generating a safe spot for yourself because as soon as you take one out, another one goes to take its place. Stupid. Stupid, I tell you. But again, like I say, we've got nice graphics, we've got smooth scrolling. We've got a technically competent game that just plays terribly. <laughs> oh, first aid kit, first aid kit. And even the collision detection on the bad guys is fairly questionable. So 
So like, they will only die if you hit a specific part of their body. If you shoot them in the legs or something, then that, it just doesn't work. I don't know about you, but if I got shot in the legs by a Tommy gun, I would almost certainly fall over. Right, I, th I think I think I've had enough of that. I think I've had more than enough of that. The Untouchables have disbanded after a raid fiasco. But there we go. I mean, that, I'm glad I looked at that because it was an interesting game to look at, particularly to see what was considered to be a good movie license game back in the day. Um, but that's not a game that holds up very well today, unfortunately. Um, I don't know a lot of Ocean's movie license games super well. Um, but from the ones I have played, that certainly does seem like one of the better ones, certainly from a technical perspective. Uh, Gameplay-wise, nah. Nah, mate. Nah, mate. Anyway, that's that for today. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.